this evening, I'm delighted to welcome back Diana Gabaldon. And back again, Adrian McKinney. We were just saying you came here from Denver. Was right. it like 20 years ago? I, I, first start, I first started coming out here in, I think, 2004 for my very first novel. Um, on my like, first five or six books, I came out here. But then for the last nine years, I've been in Australia. So it's been a little mm. harder to commute. <laughs> in any case, um, in your books, not only is there the article that will tell you the sort of fairy tale story here about the chain, but Adrian was kind enough to actually annotate a chapter in the book and tell you what his thinking was. Um, and so you have that to read as well, which I think is really fascinating. Um, beyond that, we're glad you moved back from Melbourne. Are you going to hang around in New York now? Yeah, I think so. I think I'm going to be here for a while. Counting all that money? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, that a miscontinuation too, certainly. In any case, um, that's it. So, thank you. Thank you so much, Barbara. Thank uh, you for having me. Do I need to introduce you? Do you need to introduce me? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you have no idea who I am. Um, well, just for anybody who wandered in off the streets, yeah. My name is Diana Gabaldon, and I write the Outlander series, which is a series of big, fat, indescribable books, which uh, have also been made into a TV series, so you may be more familiar with that, depending on what you read. Uh, my first beloved editor said to me when they published Outlander, she said, these have to be word of mouth books because they're too weird to describe to anyone, <laughs> which is totally true. That's true. <laughs> yes, unlike Adrian, who actually writes books that, you know, how able. I can tell you, um, the first time when I read Outlander, I knew that the book was going to hook into my brain. Um, this this would have been like, when was the first, the mid nineties? Um, no, okay. So maybe I was in, maybe I was in college, and um, I had gone to this very traditional school in Ireland um, where um, they had made us read um, like these three dick three decker eighteenth century novels, and a lot of Thomas Hardy, and so by the age of 17 I had decided that just novels were not for me. It just wasn't something that I was ever going to encounter and as soon as I finished that English class when I was 17 I just decided I was just not going to read novels ever again. <laughs> and, and so I went to, I ended up going to law school and um, uh, I found that quite dull and after like three or four years of law school I gradually started reading the odd bit of fiction again and the I remember the book that really clicked the switch in my brain, because I just accustomed in my head that novels were boring, but the book that really flipped the switch in my head was Kidnapped, oh, wow. and um, I, I, for some reason, that book, I just fell madly in love with it, and I thought, wait a second, and unlike everything my teachers told me, books are allowed to be funny, they're allowed to be exciting. You're allowed to be in love with the characters. You're allowed to go off on adventures with them. And so Kidnapped, I just it really started me on this path, lifelong path of reading novels. Now, when I read Outlander, um, when it came out, um, I thought, oh my God, this is in this milieu of Kidnapped. So I was so excited and I was following along with the story, but I didn't know that I loved the story. I hope you remember this bit. There's a bit where Claire is in a dispensary or something. It's early on, no, maybe about halfway through the novel, she's in a castle, she's looking through a dispensary, and she's people have been giving each other these little pills called Slaters. Do you remember this bit? Oh, yes. And when I saw that word, uh, the word Slater, I immediately knew what it was. But I thought that only my mother and all the people in my street were the only people who used that word. But it turns out that, that a lot of people in Scotland use what, and Slater is the local word that we would call woodlice. And um, my mother would say, oh my God, the, your bed is full of Slaters. And you come in and be all these things. And in Outlander, they were they're rolling them up into... They'd roll up into little balls. Into little balls, and then giving them to people as, <laughs> as, yeah. as medicine. Yeah. And, and I thought, well, first of all, I thought, that is so gross and disgusting. <laughs> but then I thought, wow, here's someone who's using the word Slater, this word that I never thought that I would hear again after I left Carrick Fergus, but it was in general throughout Scotland. And that was one the thing I really liked about Outlander was this Really, I really love the way Diane would bring in all these dialect words and not drown you in them, but just put them in here and there and here and there. 
And then the other thing I really liked up about the about the book was the command of tone. There was this amazing command of tone where um, there was this just this cheeky, funny. Um, to, there was there, I, there's, there's, the, there's a bit earlier on where you're describing someone who um, is riding a motorcycle, mm -hmm. and you describe the person of the same vintage as the motorcycle, <laughs> and, you, and, and, it, and it's just a nice way of saying, my God, it's a really old guy and a really old, <laughs> dangerous-looking <laughs> motorcycle, and I, and I really like that, and 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 I think that that kind of taught me that books are allowed to be fun, and that you even in this in a, even in serious uh, milieu or a serious um, topic, you're allowed to have fun with the pros and fun with the characters, and you're allowed to uh, have a little bit of wit. And you know, I've now grown not to hate Thomas Hardy as much as I, <laughs> as I used to. You're a good man. Um, <laughs> but I remember, like, giving a 14 year old boy Return of the Native. Oh, and you know, for, for O levels, exactly. <laughs> and Return of the Native, if you'll remember. I don't know if there's is there any I'll Return of the Native away. fans here? Okay, one more. On. Return of the Native. Yeah. It begins with a 10 page description of the heath. And you get the heath in the winter for three or four pages, and then you get the heath in the summer, and you're reading this going, oh my god, I know what's coming next. <laughs> and sure enough, it's the heath in the fall. And you go, well, not the exciting bit, we're going to get the heath in the spring, for, but it's not that exciting. <laughs> that, four or five that, pages of the heath in the spring. I thought, no, you don't have to. But now I've forgiven Thomas Hardy, and, and you know, I, I can buy into that universe as well. But I think that's, but it's, it's also really good to be taught by a master that you're allowed to have fun with a um, with a book. Well, thank you very much for the kind words. <laughs> yeah, that's funny that you, that you would describe it as a master because I wrote Outlander for practice without ever intending anyone to read it, which is why it's funny is because I didn't figure it made any difference. <laughs> but, clearly you, but clearly you digested hundreds of books and you'd written books in your head before you'd ever even done that. I mean, you must have had thousands of hours of reading experience. There's oh, no yeah. way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah so have you from uh, your literary articles, which I enjoy almost as much as oh, your but, books. But, thank you. Um, but, and I think that's the key is that, um, you know, you have to be a reader first. You have to be like, you have to have fun reading books first before you can actually become a writer. Yeah. No, I got three rules for a profession that actually has no rules. But if you want to become a writer, yeah, number one is read. You know, read everything, read lots of it, because that's the only way you're going to learn how, what a good book is or what good writing looks like. And number two is write, because nothing will teach you to write except the act of writing. And take all the classes, read all the books you want, but you will not learn how to write unless you actually start writing. And the more you do it, the better you get at it. So number one is read, number two is write, number three is the most important one, don't stop. And you would know something about yeah, that. <laughs> I think I think those are absolutely perfect rules. Um, so what do you th what's your opinion about like MFA courses and stuff? I've never done an MFA course. Oh, um, <laughs> find myself in an anomalous position because as an alumna of Northern Arizona University, I do support various of their programs. And so there is actually a creative writing scholarship for a master's degree MFA program with my name on it, in spite of the fact that I don't think that's any good. <laughs> I have read, you know, readable books produced by people in MFA programs. I don't think I've ever read a great book produced from that sort of program, and I've read a lot of really bad ones. I did a signing once at Changing Hands, the other bookstore down here, with a lot of people from ASU. It was some sort of uh, program that we were doing for the writing center there. I was seated next to a lady from the English department. This was her third novel, which she had to sign, and uh, so we were chatting a bit in between. And uh, I had kind of a long line of people, and she didn't. And anyway, she was looking at me you know, in total bafflement. And finally she said, do you make much money from your writing? <laughs> and I said, actually, yes. <laughs> and I kind of looked at her, and I didn't ask. You know, but, uh, but I bought one of her books. I normally do buy the books of anybody that I'm signing with, you know. Out of courtesy and curiosity, you find a lot of stuff that you would never otherwise come across that way. But anyway, I read it and it didn't increase my respect for the MFA programs. <laughs> yeah, this is because, you know, the reading, they can kind of get you to do that. And it does force you to write, so yeah. as, as far as that goes. But you're, you're writing for a committee if you're writing for the my, kind of university. My feeling study. is that the, the, the prose is sometimes very polished and sometimes too polished. Mm -hmm. 
and they, 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 a lot of those MFA books, they all sound a little bit the same. Yes, they do. <laughs> and, and, and you know, oh, but this is somebody who knows all the rules of grammar, and they know the rules of composition, and they have a, they've got this structure, or sometimes not a structure, a, you know, a, a very um, sort of inorganic uh, book, but there's no heart in it, and there's no kind of passion in it, and, um, and that's the thing that, you know, that sometimes is a little bit missing, and that, and I think you, you, you can only learn really from being driven and, and having the, the passion for, for, the, for the story. And, um, and, I, and I, think that, I think that maybe is a little bit of a problem with, with that, kind of, that kind of world, where you're writing to please your teacher mm -hmm. rather than writing to please yourself. Exactly. And, and if you write to please yourself, you're going to keep going. And when it's bringing <laughs> some crazy old professor you know, um, what's going to happen when you graduate and the crazy old professor is no longer there yelling at you to, to write your book. You well, it'll get better probably. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, no, but it works the same way if you're writing, you know, in order to sell. You know, I know a lot of writers who want to write YA because that's the hot thing right now and I'm thinking, do you ever read YA fiction? <laughs> you know, because if you don't, you're going to write it very well. But that's the, uh, I, I remember I was uh, teaching a writer's workshop in, um, Brisbane, Australia, but about three or four years ago, and I was doing a crime fiction workshop, and I was saying, and I would say to people, so who here um, um, has read James Elroy? Because I was about to do a, a thing on James Elroy. Not a single hand. <laughs> you know, this room full of thirty people. No one had read James Elroy. I thought, okay, I'm in trouble here, Adrian, because the next twenty minutes was going to be about James Elroy. And I thought, that's okay. Go to the old standbys. Uh, okay, who's read Elmore Leonard? Yeah. And I just got again. No. Total <laughs> sense. Oh, oh, oh my God! Oh. <laughs> now in huge amount of trouble. Let's go. Well, who have you read? And you know, they maybe read one or two contemporary crime fiction novels, and they thought, well, I can do that. And I was like, no, 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 no. You have to read everything. You have to read everything, like from now from five years ago, from 10 years ago, from 50 years ago, from a thousand years ago. You just have to read, read, read. And uh, that's not what they wanted to hear. Uh, <laughs> they wanted to hear, uh, give me six quick fixes and rules, <laughs> and, uh, and then I'll go home and I'll write my bestseller, and uh, <laughs> you know, it'll all be over. But that it doesn't work that way. The thing is, everybody wants to know what uh, writer's secrets are. And the thing is, we don't have any secrets. Anything we know how to do is right there on the page. <laughs> we have to do is uh, learn to look for it. And I'm especially pleased that Margaret mentioned you had annotated one of your chapters with what you were thinking, because that way you will know why he did this, that, and the other. Yeah, I mean, it, the, one of the chapters that it's in a, it, you'll see what I what I what I put in the book was I can't remember which chapter it was. Thirty nine. Thirty nine. Um, okay, I think maybe that got changed to chapter 40 in the actual, if you, if you go to chapter 39, it's actually really chapter 40 uh, in the actual book, but I think one, one of the reasons I picked that for this was because it's a short chapter, so it was actually um, fairly easy to annotate it, and I think one of the reasons I also picked that was because it's got a real simple structure, it begins with a description, and then it begins with um, a, a build up, and then there's action, and then there's conclusion. And that's just a really, really simple structure. So you, it's like shooting a film. You begin with the establishing shot, so you can see everything, and then you come into the characters, and then and you have the action, there's gotta be some tension, and then it's there's a resolution at the end. And, um, and if you do a lot of chapters like that, well, you, you've got yourself a book. I remember when the Da Vinci Code came out first, I had not had time to read it, and it was everywhere, and someone had given me a copy, which I had left at home. I saw my 18-year-old youngest daughter reading it, and I said, oh, how is that? And she said, well, the writing is just terrible. And she said in the plot, you know, it, it smacks you between the eyes. He said, but she will lead you on and then give you this little cliffhanger at the end of each chapter, so you'll turn the page. I said, okay, that's all I need to know about it. So, in fact, I never have read it. <laughs> that guy, what's the, what's the, what's the Dan, Brown. Dan, Brown. Dan Brown. That guy, I saw an interview with him about a year ago. He messed up my life for about three months uh, because I saw an interview with him, and it seemed such a brilliant idea uh, to me. 
and the, the interviewer said to him, so when do you write down? And he says, well, what I like to do is I like to wake up um, really early in the morning um, when I haven't had enough sleep and when I'm still in the dream state. And then I sit down at my computer when I'm still half awake and half dreaming, and then I'll, I'll write. I remember reading that and just going, that is genius. That's absolutely fantastic. That's what I'm going to do. So I set my alarm for like two hours earlier. And for the next three months, my life was a disaster. <laughs> because I wasn't getting enough sleep. The stuff I was writing in the morning was horrible. It was just absolutely gibberish. And then the kids were saying, Dad, can you help with my homework? I said, ah, oh, I don't know how to do any of that stuff. I was exhausted. And my wife's going, you're killing yourself. Stop doing this. They said, no, no, it's worked for Dan Brown. It'll work for me. And then after like three months of this experiment, I read this, all this stuff I've been writing in the morning. just thought, this is just drivel. Because you know, when you're having dreams, most of your dreams are nonsense. You know, and then I met the president. And then the Queen of England came in and she said, where's my tea? And I said to the Queen, I don't know. I give it to the cat. That's a lot of rubbish. So poor Dan Brown, oh my god, I don't have words with that guy. And, you know, he robbed me of a quarter of my a quarter of a year of my life. <laughs> what does your biorhythm let you write? <laughs> yeah, what is she tell me, uh, Dan, I have something really intriguing to ask you. What is your writing schedule? This is quite interesting, isn't it? Your your I like I'd like to hear a little bit more about this and how, and how you got into that schedule. Uh, well, um, in part, it's because I had uh, three children in four years, and therefore I learned how to fall asleep in you know five seconds flat anytime anyone left me alone. But I also had uh, two full-time jobs along with the three small children, and for some reason I decided this was the ideal time to begin writing the novel that I had always known I was supposed to write, and so I did. Well, the only time you write for any sustained um, amount of time with small children is in the middle of the night. Luckily, this suited me because I have always been a night owl. I am not constructed for a office, nine to five world kind of thing. I mean, for years and years and years, all the way through elementary school, all the way through high school, every single morning I would be dragged out of bed at 7 a.m. and I would be sitting there on the edge of my bed like, one day I will never have to get up at 7 a.m. again. <laughs> and so I finally hit that spot. I do not get up at 7 a.m. or anywhere near it. Uh, I do work from about midnight to 4.30 in the morning is my time. So yeah, well, it's, it's quiet. There's no psychic noise. The, the world is quiet. Right? The street's quiet. There's yeah. nothing. Yeah, yeah. yeah and I take the dogs out. Maybe a coyote in the, yeah. in the distance. Yeah, we got coyotes, yeah. yeah. Also raccoons. Yeah. <laughs> and so you just, so, so everyone's asleep by midnight, and then... Yeah, well, earlier than that. I mean, the kids now are, what, 37, 35, and 33. Right. Uh, so they were two, four, and six when I started writing out right. there. <laughs> this goes to show you. Um, so they have all left home, but my husband <laughs> is a lark, luckily. He would get the kids up for breakfast and, and so forth in the morning during the, the kid raising years. And I would then be the night guard. He could go to bed at 9 o'clock and I would be awake, alert, and ready for people, you know, who had homework yeah. problems or bad palm date or whatever. I would take care of that. So uh, we still keep that schedule more or less. So I'll tuck him in bed around 9 and then I go lie down on the house bed with the dogs and a book. And within 10 minutes I'll fall asleep because I stop moving, I fall asleep, is basically what it amounts to. And uh, then I wake up naturally around midnight and I go upstairs and start work and work till 4.30. I do work during the day at periods, so, mm -hmm. but it tends to be spotty. You know, some days I can get a little work done before lunch. Most days I can get an hour or two after lunch and then I start doing the household errands and so forth. If nobody's home, I can get another couple of hours in the evening before I nap and uh, so forth. So, you know, we fill in the holes. And as I get closer and closer to the end of a book, I work more and more <laughs> during the day as well as in the middle of the night. So it's so romantic, though, really. I mean, it's the witching hour. Yeah, you're, sit, yeah. you're, 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 you're sitting down and the world is asleep. Mm -hmm. And then you're creating your own universe and your own characters that you can play with. And have oh, exactly them. right, yeah. yeah. I mean, that, I, ideally, that sounds like perfect. But unfortunately for me, I made that I'm exhausted. <laughs> I'm just broken. At the time you spilled everything you've been. Fed up, depressed, <laughs> miserable. But, you know, I think, but for me, a good time is actually from, from 10 to about midnight. Really? Yeah, yeah, I think, like, because you're right, everybody's quiet. Mm -hmm. It's usually quite still, and then, and, 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 and you can, but then after about 12, I start to get really tired. Mm -hmm. But then sometimes also, um, you'll get on a roll, and you will find yourself going to, like, one or two yeah. in the morning, you know, 
four hours of, of going in that shift. So it is quite interesting. But you would sleep first. Yeah. So you'll sleep first and then wake and, yeah, then, and, then, write, sleep and then sleep again. Yeah. yeah, this is very 18th century, back in the day when people did not have electric lights and the candles were expensive. You know, they would uh, you know, eat supper by candlelight, blow out the candle, go to bed. Okay, the nights are pretty long, especially in the winter, and really nobody needs to sleep for 16 hours. So they would crawl in bed, you know, get warm and so forth, but then they'd wake up four or five hours later and they would get up, you know, and write letters to their friends, light the candle again, and, uh, you know, read a book, you know, have sex, uh, go back to bed and sleep again for the, what they call the second sleep. Second sleep, oh, yeah. yeah. And that works fine for me. <laughs> and it's right, it, that's quite common in Northern Europe. As you say, when, like in Belfast, they would get dark about three in the afternoon in winter time, and then, uh, I remember thinking it's so unjust, um, because we would go to school at about eight in the morning, in winter, just as it was getting light. And then we would get out of school at three, and um, just as it's getting dark. Yeah. So for all of December and January, we'd never see light. You know, because it'd be in, and it must be, the weather would be too miserable to go outside. It'd be raining all the time. Uh, so you just never see light for about, for about two months. It was, uh, so that was quite miserable. Yeah, and I like that notion. In Bali, um, and they have a very similar thing. They have, um, it's not a second sleep, but the night is divided into two, is a, is a four hour of um, sleep, and then they get up and they have a meal, and the, everyone would come down, like maybe about one or two in the morning, and they have a meal, and then they would have a, you know, co a big communal meal, and then um, people would go back to bed for like another, digestive. Yeah, yeah, another three or four hours yeah. until like um, eight, eight in the morning. Yeah. Um, so I think it's, it's quite common, and, and, and if you think, back to like the Serengeti or wherever, hunter-gatherers probably similar stories. Yeah. The fire would constantly be going, maybe we'd come up in the middle of the night and they would tell a story, yeah. and everyone would gather around, listen to the story, and then they'd, they'd go back and sleep. Yeah. Okay. How long, uh, I should say, what age were you when you left Ireland, and what made you leave? Um, well, I was, uh, I lived there until I was about 19. And then I went off to university in England and kind of never really got back. Um, lived in England for um, about four or five years. And then the old story, I met a girl and <laughs> she was American. And, and I sort of begged her, I said, please, can I come with you to America? And uh, she said, no, you certainly can't. And, and then I said, please. And then she said, what are you gonna do in America? And because um, I had a philosophy degree, in which you can do nothing really <laughs> with, but so she, it was a serious question yeah. from her part: What are you going to do in America with a philosophy degree? And uh, and I said, Well, like every Irish person, I'll get a job in a bar. <laughs> <laughs> and then she said, and she knew I was kind of an effete young man. Um, who probably hadn't done a lot of bar work in his life, and I said, no, 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 I'll probably get a job at a bar, no problem. And funnily enough, she was living in New York, and I, I'll never forget this, I arrived in New York in, on Wednesday night, and by Saturday night, I was pulling pints in a pub in the Bronx, um, within literally three days. And my, I remember my job interview went like this. I've been told there was these Irish bars in the Bronx, they were looking for, my job interview went in, and I went in and they said, um, I'm looking for work, and the guy says to me, where, where are you from? I said, I'm from Belfast, no, no, and he said, well, look, can you start Saturday? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yes, and then, I'm, okay, and then he says to me, as I'm going out the door, it's like Colombo, he says, look, just one more thing, and he says, you know how to pull a pint of Guinness, don't you? And I said, oh, of course I do, of course I do, and I walked out there, and immediately I was on my phone, my, uh, on the phone my friend Noel McKee, who is a barman, I said, Noel, how do you pour a pint of Guinness? <laughs> and Noel's going, oh, it's very complicated, Adrian. <laughs> oh, dear me. I'm going to do the first third, and I've let that settle. Going, oh, my God. Can you send me a diagram? Not on Saturday. You'll just have to listen. And they talked me through this half an hour process of pouring a proper yes. pint of Guinness, which they were so not interested in. Yeah. And when I got to the Bronx, you know, I'd learned this Dublin pour method of pouring a pint of Guinness, which like takes half an hour. <laughs> it's the work of art. It's like black to here, and then there's the half-inch head above the glass, and the head is so thick that you can put a, 
a very heavy coin on the head that doesn't sink. And everybody in the Bronx is going, where's that pint I ordered? What the hell? Who is this new guy you've got on, Marty? What's his problem? I'm just going, no, sir. Believe me, when you get this, I just want a nice son. <laughs> so I did some sort of compromise between the um, twenty-minute pour and the two-minute pour job. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I ended up I ended up working there for about a, for about a year. Yeah. yeah. So when did you actually start writing? Uh, that was a that was a that was a long and winding road as well. Um, I was um, I ended up marrying this girl. And I became a school teacher in Colorado, in Denver, and I was teaching. Um, I was teaching the short story unit to these kids, and uh, which I always really enjoyed because you would teach them some great stuff. Yeah. You know, we would do like up in Michigan, and we would do you know all these all these fantastic short stories. Some of Joyce's short stories, short stories with like like domestic stories, but with a little epiphany, you know, that kind of, that kind of thing. And um, at the end of the unit, um, I would always say to them something they always hated. Uh, you'd have to write your own story. <laughs> and um, uh, it was just like a five or six page story. And I would always say to them, like, like nothing about space or <laughs> war, please. You know, just, just a little simple story about your life. You know? And I said, whatever you do, it'll be really good. Because I've been teaching this for years and it's going to be fantastic. Trust me. And they would all, especially the boys, would always say, oh my God, my life is so boring. You never, you, nobody's going to want to hear it. And I said, well, just fictionalize it. You know, make something, you know. Fi-. So anyway, it, they were always fantastic. And there, there was one I remember, I will never forget this. It was this girl, she came to me, and she begged, she said, please, please, um, can you pass me the class if I don't turn in a story? I said, nope. Um, she's going to turn in a story. And I said, please, please, because I don't want to write a story. She said, I'm not a writer. You know, it's such a... So she went off, and she wrote... One of the greatest things I've ever read in my life. It was the story, it was all basically true, of our house had been burgled. And um, the burglars had gone in, they'd stolen some jewelry and stuff like that, and they'd gone into her room and they'd, she had her little rings from Claire's accessories and all the stuff that had been stolen. But down in the bottom drawer of her bureau was the only thing that mattered to her in the whole world was this certificate of adoption where she'd been adopted into the family. And they had opened up the drawer and they dumped all that on the ground. And of course, that was just a piece of paper, a meaningless piece of paper to them. But to her, this was the most important thing in the whole world. And as soon as she wrote this story, and I remember just it being in buckets of tears, like reading this story at the end. And then she she gets the adoption. Story. I'm crying. And I, you know, I, my wife says, What's going on? I said, You've got to read this story. And my wife reads this story, and then she's crying at the end. And then I go to her, and I said, By the way, you're, you're getting an A plus for this class. And I said, Please, can I read this out to the rest of the class? And, um, and she says, No, no, it's crap. I says, Believe me, it's not crap. And I read it out to the rest of the class. And, like, you know, all, you know, all the girls are flooded tears, but even more surprisingly, all the boys are like hiding their faces. <laughs> their heads are going like this, they're like sobbing. And I just go, and this is what great writing can do to people. It'll just like, break you and destroy you and just fill you with these incredible sensations of emotion. And anyway, I think it was at the end of that year when the kids said to me, Oh, Mr. McKinney, you're such a hypocrite. And here you are telling us about oh great literature and you, we have to write we have to go, where's your story why are you writing anything and 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 I thought to myself well you know I guess I have been a bit of a hypocrite um, because I'd written it I'd written it I'd written a, I'd written a uh, novella and I'd written a a couple pieces for Harper's um, and then I kind of just stopped writing for about four or five years I'd written nothing and I thought well maybe I should write a novel. And um, so I started writing it, and, and, and this story got longer and longer and longer until I had written this basically autobiographical novel um, called Dead I Well May Be. That was autobiographical. It was about 80% it was about 80% true. Um, Michael, does, Michael does a couple more killings in the book than, uh, than I did in real life. But everything else about it was like the people I hung out with. It was, it's so easy to write a book when 
you're hanging out with these people and they're just giving you all this free dialogue all the time. Just tons of free dialogue. You just keep talking yeah, there. Yeah. yeah, but just writing all this down. This is fantastic. It's gold. You don't know it, but it's gold. Everything you're doing, Patty, is fantastic. So um, that was about 80% autobiographical. And, um, and then it was just, um, I didn't know how to get a novel published. I had no clue. Um, but I actually was very, very lucky but because this guy I'd worked with at Harper's, um, I'd just been a fact checker at Harper, Harper's and they let me write a, um, a couple of pieces. This guy I'd uh, worked with at Harper's was now an editor at Simon & Schuster. So I sent him a chapter and I said, I don't know if you remember me, I was the awkward person in the, <laughs> in the office. Um, like it, I, I was so starstruck in that place because David Foster Wallace used to come in at, at that time and I would just be like, in the corner of the office, backing away, because uh, I was I, I used to read his essays in, in Harper's, and I just thought they were oh, I couldn't believe it, and um, so I was like always like so like hiding from Dave Foster was. I said so I wrote this letter to Colin Harrison. I, said, I don't know if you remember me. I was the awkward guy in the corner, and I've written a novel. Uh, and this is a terrible imposition, but would you mind reading the book? And, and he read it and said, yeah, we'll publish that. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how I sort of got started on, on, on down the road. It's basically how, did you get, how did you get started? Um, oh, uh, well, I'd always known from a very young age that I was supposed to be a novelist. I just you know, didn't know how. Right. And I came from a conservative family background. My dad would say to me, you're such a poor judge of character, you're bound to marry some ball. He said, so be sure you get a good education so you can support your children. <laughs> so, so I have three, three advanced degrees in the biological sciences, including a PhD in quantitative behavioral e ecology. I, I've, I've seen your tweets on biology. Uh, on, you know, I, I like it on Twitter when someone tries to catch you out in a biology question. <laughs> and then Diana it. brings the whole fleet <laughs> forward and gives them broadside after broadside. Well, this is why you're wrong about this. And this is the evidence why you're wrong. You just go, oh my god. <laughs> I'm never going to make a biology mistake. <laughs> well, it's pretty easy not to get in Twitter wars. <laughs> if you get all the ammunition and all the weaponry on your side, oh my god. They, they, they've definitely brought a knife to a gunfight, those people. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> yes, I mean, you don't like to slaughter people in cold blood, exactly. But on the other hand, you're going to want to uh, you know, not get in wars. So if uh, someone comes after you, you better squash them fast. Is that, is that where you got all your lore of? And there's, oh, I remember in London, there's all this stuff about plants, oh, yeah. and healing plants. Mm -hmm. uh, there was it, is it? I remember they would make all these. She couldn't get anti antibiotics right. in the 18th century, but you would make a kind of yeah, a purple medicines. Yeah, 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 of, uh, yeah. Which actually, you know, if you know the same stuff in them that. Uh, uh, and they've, they've, they've proven that, like oh, they, yeah. they, they have fever reducing qualities. Yeah, the willow bark tea has salicylic acid, yeah. which is aspirin. I mean, it is aspirin, right. <laughs> not even transform. It's just, you know, it's hard to standardize the dosage if you don't know how much tea to give somebody to relieve their pain. On the other hand, it's really hard to OD on herbal medicine <laughs> because you have to concentrate it to such a degree. You know, this is why for a long, long time people thought that medicine had to taste bad to be any good. It's because to get an effective dosage of herbal medicine, you had to concentrate it until it was really bitter. And so people got used to that. If they if it tasted bad, it was bound to do you some good. <laughs> and that seems to have faded away in the last 50 years or but she so. Does, she, she, but Claire does bring the germ theory of disease to... Uh, she does, yeah. She, she, the very levels of success, yeah. Do you ever read those Patrick O'Brien? Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah and I've listened, I picked listening to them on audiobooks. I've read them four or five times. And I'm about on the 18th listening of them. Um, really? Yeah. Because I'm a, oh, who do you, who's your audiobook? Um, um, Patrick Tull. Patrick Tull? Uh, okay, do you guys know um, the Patrick O'Brien books um, narrated by Patrick Tull? They're, they're just the greatest thing ever. Yes. They're, they're just absolutely the greatest thing ever. And I've listened to, there's one called The Wine Dark Sea, which is one right in the middle of the series. It's like book 17. It's book, there's 21 books in the sequence. And The Wine Dark Sea is book 17 in the sequence. And almost nothing happens in the entire <laughs> novel, and it's genius. It's just absolutely genius. It's just a bunch of guys on a ship sailing through the Pacific, kind of nothing happening, 
for like two or three hundred pages, then he goes to Peru yeah. for like yeah. like thirty or forty pages, yeah. and then it's it. And then it's done. And then, and there's an undersea volcano in the middle yeah, of it. There is. There's the <laughs> rocks land on the ship, and um, and so the, the, and there's another one. I think it's the one where they go to Mo, the Malay Republic and he sees the rhinoceros. Oh yeah. <laughs> and he climbs up the steps again. Hundreds of pages where nothing much happens. Yeah, with the orangutan. Yeah, yeah. At, at all. He befriends, the, the, I guess the, the most exciting thing that happens in the book is he befriends an orangutan mm -hmm. and he walks up a set of steps with him. Yeah. And that's probably the most, there's two baddies in the book. There's two real villains that we've been pursuing for five or six books. And Patrick O'Brien kills them off screen. Like these two guys. As if he's thought to himself, Everybody's expecting some huge climactic duel mm -hmm. to happen with these two villains. We've been pursuing for five seconds. I'm just going to mention off screen at the end of a chapter that they're dead, and I'm never going to give you the satisfaction. Just out of pure perversity. And I remember, I, I remember, I was out walking my neighbor's dog, listening to that on an audio book, and it was a cassette. So this would have been the, I guess, mid '90s, and I took it to the library. And I said, there's some kind of mistake here. <laughs> and I said, and I said, and I said, what's happened? I said, there's a cassette missing. There's like a whole battle scene that's supposed to happen here. And this is Denver Public Library. And they said, oh, we'll do, we'll look into that. So I came back to the library like a couple weeks later. I said, well, what's going on? I'm looking for this one tape. And said, no. They said there's nine tapes in the in the, the thing. I said, no, no, that can't be right. And uh, and so eventually I. Wrote to the books on tape people. I <laughs> said, so "There's a tape missing." And said, "No, it's not." So then I went and actually got the book <laughs> and read the actual book. And I thought, "Oh my God, that bastard! <laughs> How, why would he do this?" You got to admit, the point the part where you, you realize that they're dead is pretty good. It's 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 dramatic. It, yeah. And then I thought, oh "My God!" And then I think to yourself. I, I, the, the main climactic action of this book is the bit with the, the, the orangutan. Oh, yeah, the, the part with the sultan and his Ganymede and uh, what happened oh, to yeah, yeah, and the, all that, the, but the that's servants, kind of secondary, yeah. The servants, yeah, that's great. And then also the, uh, the, uh, the governor, doesn't he die off screen at the end of the book? He goes off into a typhoon in a boat. <laughs> The 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 the, the, um, the guy who's doing the treaty in that book. Oh, that one, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he, so the, there's a, there's a kind of another main character who we grown to not like. Yeah, he's very dislikable. He's sort and of he, a and, and yeah. at the end of the book, he goes off in a boat, in and then there's a typhoon, and we don't know what happens. And in the next book, we find out that he's also died off screen. Those books are masterpieces of what not to do <laughs> in a novel, but somehow. He makes it work. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how he does it. Yeah, well, it comes down to what's at the root of every great book, which is the characters. You know, he's got two main characters: um, John Aubrey, who's a Royal Navy captain, and his friend Stephen Maturin, who is an illegitimate Irish surgeon who signs on as a ship's doctor because he's starving to death. And this is his only opportunity. Anyway, they become you know fast friends through the whole thing, while holding completely opposing views of almost everything in the world, <laughs> and you know that it, just following their lives is you know extremely fascinating. And also, he's got a real ear for dialect and uh, and uh, early nineteenth century slang. So uh, just before we leave this topic, yeah, because I could talk about this for the next four hours, <laughs> and I'm sure you don't want to hear that. But there, the Patrick Toll versions are amazing if you listen to the audiobooks because he does Stephen Maturin with an Irish accent. Uh, Whereas like, three or four of the other audio um, narrators do not. Um, and to me, that kind of ruins the whole book. And if you see the film where Russell Crowe and I uh, can't remember who plays Matcher in, in Semi No? Paul Brittany. Paul Br he Paul doesn't, Br doesn't do an Irish accent. No, he doesn't. And at one point in the film, he says, Well, I am Irish, but he doesn't sound Irish at all. Uh, and uh, he does do it. But um, there's an amazing, uh, just a uh, before I leave this up, there's an amazing one, and it's one of the most amazing pieces of audiobook I've ever heard in my life, where they put Jack in the stocks for ringing the stock exchange, mm -hmm. and Patrick told us this narration where you've got this hero that you've grown to love through 10 books, and they're about to pelt him with vegetables and stones, and, uh, and it's just this amazing sequence in the books, 
um, where um, instead of the mob coming in from London, the whole street just fills up with Jack's old seamen, all the old officers and crew he's got. And then instead of, he has to be in the stocks for one hour at noon, and the street just fills up with his old shipmates, and they spend an hour cheering him. Like, you know, just cheering him for the whole street. And it's just one of those things. I remember, I, again, I was out in the park, I think, or outside listening. To it. I just had to stop it because my breath was taken away. Because that sequence was so emotional and so good. It really, first of all, buy my books, then buy old Diana's. <laughs> <laughs> and then go out and just fill your basket full of Patrick O'Brien's <laughs> novels. If you've any money left. <laughs> So Adrian, you've yeah. actually yes, done the magic. Should we talk about the chain? Yes, we should. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to talk about it. Just having too much fun. I have to get up and say this because this is just so funny. We, we have for years told you that most of our events are about the digression because we can't talk about the book for very long. This, <laughs> this has been an all-time record. <laughs> <laughs> and in reverse, because normally we talk about the book for a few minutes and then it goes wherever we want it to go. So it's been fabulous. I'm so glad we got it on tape, but could you just mention the shame? <laughs> 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 which is that I loved all of your books because they have wonderful characters and so forth. This one is a total uh, deviation for you. It's completely different than all your others, but I am totally fascinated by it. Not only just the totally cool premise, which you can explain to them, it's, it's, it's you know, grabs you immediately, you want to know how does that work, what's going to happen, etc. And it's a real thriller, you know, you your pages all the way through. I don't think you have one paragraph that has more than three sentences in it, and they're all very short sentences. And what struck me about halfway through the book was I thought I could diagram each one of your chapters like you do a sentence, you know, as you said, about the structure and so forth. And you can see it. It's just like, you know, put together a Swiss watch and you just watch all the little wheels turn and all the cogs click into place and all that. And there are two places in it where I laugh. I, I laugh frequently in most of your books and this one, you know, it's, it's such a thriller. It's not intended to have a lot of humor. But I laughed in two places. One of them is where they arrive at, uh, you know, the, the abattoir. And uh, she thinks this would be a perfect place for a day no more. And of course, that's exactly what's about to happen. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I remember that line. It says, um, everything about this house screamed denouement. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, the denouement proceeds to happen immediately. The other part was further on in this section when she finally fires the, the, the gun. I don't want to tell them what the line is because you should read that for yourself. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes you can have a little, I'm going to digress. <laughs> Som sometimes you can have a little bit of um, breaking the fourth wall. Um, I remember, again, this is, I'm going to bring it back to Diana. Um, there's a bit where um, Claire, who my memory is, is, um, is at the Standing Stones, and then, or maybe it's on a trip to Stonehenge, she's remembering a trip to Stonehenge, and she says something like, it's you breaking the fourth wall, she says something like, uh, you might care to know that there's 59 stones here, but I'm not interested in that in the least. And it's you, the author, breaking the fourth wall to go out and talk to the reader in the voice of Claire's first person narration. And I thought that was really cool. I really love it when authors have a little bit of fun and do this, yeah, these, these little adventures with the text themselves. Um, okay, The Chain, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a standalone thriller. Um, I really wanted to know if I could write a, um, I write kind of slow paced noir type novels, but I really wanted to do a thriller where um, I kind of wrote it by the seat of my pants. I'm very much a planner um, in terms of my novels. And this one, I kind of had the initial idea. The initial idea is, is this, um, a woman's driving to an oncology appointment in Boston, and she gets this phone call from a <coughs> frantic stranger. And this frantic stranger says to her, uh, she, she's named Rachel, and she says, Rachel, I'm so sorry to have to tell you this. I've got some terrible news. Um, I've kidnapped your daughter. And she goes, no, you haven't. I just left her off at the school bus stop. And then she shows her a picture of, of her daughter, Kylie, on her camera phone. And she said, the reason I've kidnapped your daughter is because my son has also been kidnapped by a completely different stranger. And it turns out they're part of this evil, demonic, diabolic entity known as the chain. And the only way you get off the chain is you pay this ransom, and then your loved one's been kidnapped, you have to find someone to take your loved one's place. 
And if you break any of the rules, if you go to the cops, if you tell anybody about it, um, you, the instructions are very clear. You have to kill that um, troublesome member of the chain and kidnap someone else. And so all the people above the chain are monitoring you, and then you have to monitor everybody beneath the chain. Um, and it's this, it's, as one of the characters in the book calls it, it's the Uber of kidnapping. Because everybody is policing themselves, and you become first a victim, and then you next become an abductor, and then you become a criminal. And one of the things I really wanted to do with the book was I wanted to, uh, I studied moral philosophy, and I wanted to see if you could really test someone's deepest moral beliefs and have them do terrible things. And whether I can have these characters do terrible things and still keep the reader along for the journey. Because you have this person who is completely, and, and if you ever seen the film Ransom or um, Taken, um, Liam Neeson has a special set of skills <laughs> in, in, in Taken, but um, Rachel in this book has no skills whatsoever. She's just an ordinary person. She doesn't have a lot of money. She has no skills. Um, and she just has to, um, she's thrust into this nightmare and to see if she can survive this nightmare. And, it, and also another thing I wanted to do was, well, I'll backtrack. The story, that, that, when I was in primary school, the story that impressed me most uh, was the story of Demeter and Persephone. And it was one of the very first things we learned in primary school. And Demeter, um, if you remember that Greek myth, she, she literally goes into hell and she rescues her daughter from the abyss. And she saves her daughter from the, from the darkness and she brings her back. And, um, and I remember just reading that story and thinking, this is a story of a mother who literally goes into hell and, and, and saves her daughter from hell. But the thing about the Demeter and Persephone story is that Persephone gets back, but she doesn't get all the way back. And um, that's why the Greeks believe that they have winter, and they have, because uh, Persephone is a goddess of fertility, and the way they have the, 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 the barren seasons, because Persephone hasn't made it all the way home, and there's a part of her still left in hell. And that's why I wanted to have um, that idea running throughout this, this book as well. That even after she gets her daughter back, um, you know, that's not a spoiler because that happens about halfway through the book, um, there's still these terrible consequences that have to be laid out in, in for the second and third acts of the story. And if you if you remember from Ransom and from Taken, um, the big scene is the reunion, which happens at the bottom of the third act. The music swells, the credits roll, that's the end. And so my big scene is the reunion, which happens halfway through. And then you're, as the reader, going, well, what happens in the second half of the book? And that's when it really gets crazy oh, yeah. in the second half of the book. No, it was just a masterpiece of engineering, both emotionally and, you know, uh, writerly. Well, thank you, Diana. Um, it was like, it, it was, again, it was one of those things that I began just on a frenzy. Like, for the first 20 or 30 pages, were all written kind of in one go. But there's no way you could continue a book like that, you have to have the structure. You have to know, ah, okay, this is this act, this is this act, this is this act. So the whole next 280 pages were all kind of planned out and you and, and you had to be aware of the the emotional beats and also the geography and, 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 and everything that's happening in the story. You have to you have to really carefully and also I you know I was quite worried for a lot of the book. Um, because I thought to myself, you know, all I generally do very sympathetic characters, you know, who do a little, you know, they have comedy and they are they make fun of themselves and this is a, there's no place for comedy when your kid's being kidnapped. Mm -hmm. There's just no room for any of that kind of nonsense. <clears throat> and um, it's all drama all the time. And so and also so I thought she was not very sympathetic in that respect. And then she and she does some really awful things um, it, within those first 80 pages. And so that, that was also a worry whether I'd be able to keep the, um, keep the readers on board with me. But, you know, I'm obviously not going to keep all the readers on, on board with me, but I think everybody has to make a decision for themselves about what they would do in that situation. Yeah, well, that's what keeps them going. You're thinking, my God, if this was me, you know, the, the empathy level is very, very high. 
There's another question. I mean, almost all of the books that of yours that I've read have had male protagonists, and so far there is this one. It's a it's a woman who you did very well, by the way. At the, did that feel different to you? It, 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 that, that's the story that that's the story that told itself. Like that, there was no way this could have been any other. That was the protagonist. She was right there in front of me, and she was the. You know, it's funny. You'll get this sometimes, where the story tells itself through you, rather you telling the story. And this, I mean, sometimes that happens, sometimes it doesn't. Um, but this was definitely a case where the story was telling itself through me. The protagonist was there. The the daughter was there. The setting was there. The geography, everything was completely there, and I was just the vector for um, their story. It was like. It was like this had happened in another universe. This whole thing had actually happened, <laughs> and I had s seen it happen, or they wanted me to know about it. And they said, "You've got to tell everybody this thing that's happened to us." And so that was the whole reason. There was no other way it could have been a, a, a male protagonist or any other character could have, could have been different in any in any other way. Yeah, no, it was just perfect. You know, very gem like. And my husband calls writing like that lapidary, and he's right. It was like fascinating a jam, but you you did it just really right. Yeah, and also, uh, and and the, well, thank you for saying that. That's very kind of you to say that. But 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 for the whole thing about that, you were mentioning. Well, I won't do the spoiler, but you're mentioning obliquely Chekhov um, <laughs> earlier, um, and one of the things that for this story in particular. One of the things that Chekhov did with this short story is, is that he would read the he would read the story, and then he would realize that it was like nine words too long, and he would cut nine words out of it, and then he'd read it again, and then and it, for him it was always a process of cutting, and um, and for this novel, uh, this was again it was a process of cutting, like taking stuff out. Like for me, normally I'll throw anything in there. You know, if I think if there's a joke that I think somebody will do, and I'll go, oh, I will throw the joke in there. If there's a piece of music someone's listening to, I'll go, oh my God, I really want the readers to know about this piece of music that I love and that my characters love. So by God, they're going to spend a page <laughs> listening to this music. You know, I have characters who go off bird watching for like three pages, and I'll describe every bloody bird. I mean, no wonder these books never sold. Um, <laughs> And every bloody bird they see, and 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 uh, but I knew when in, in a thriller, um, the most important things are characters. First of all, it has to be good characters, and then the next thing is the characters have to turn the wheel of the story. It has to. You've got to have momentum. So for this book, instead of me putting things in that I liked, instead it was the painful, painful process of me taking stuff I liked out. And I just go, no, I can't cut, this is great, this is a fantastic joke, but no, no one was making a joke in that situation, so it had to go, or this scene, or you know, it's just, all these extraneous stuff just went, and the, the Isaac Bashev Singer has this quote, and he says, the best friend of the writer is the waste paper basket, and I kind of never really believed that. You know, uh, I said, no, 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 let's just keep it all in. They can, they can skip it. They can skip it. <laughs> if they don't like it, they can fast forward it, or they can skip it, you know, whatever. But for this one, I couldn't do that. I, I had to, um, strip to the bone. Yeah, I had to, I had to strip it to the bone and, and just, um, you know, have the momentum of the story. And, uh, and I think also that's what the story was telling me as well. The story was telling me, um, forget all the stuff that you normally do. Tell me, tell me. This is this, this is the story that you have to go. So is that good enough, Barbara? Was You're that was worth waiting for? <laughs> yeah, it's great. And now you go back to the What are you going to do with Sean? Uh, the, there's going to be a, there's going to be another Sean Duffy novel. Um, I've actually written it. Um, I was writing it this year. Um, and that's actually done. That one's called The Detective Up Late. And so that'll be the seventh one in that series. And that brings him up to, I don't know how, in every book, I've got this other series of mysteries called the Sean Duffy series, and I don't know how he survives. He's, he's a detective in Northern Ireland in the 1980s. And he, that, that poor man, he's been blown up, he's been shot, he's been blown up again, uh, he's been shot again. 
Um, so I don't know if his luck's going to hold up for much longer, but it, but it lasts at least for one more book um, for, for, for book seven. Uh, so there is, there's going to be at least one more of those. Mm -hmm. That's good news. I love those. <laughs> yeah, those, those, are, those are really fun. Th those, those are the books that do have like three pages on bird washing. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to take questions? Yes, oh, I'm sorry. Q&A, please. Any questions you'd like for me or Diana or for Barbara? <laughs> <laughs> what, yeah. what are some of your other favorite authors that you read when you're like stuck or to just to enjoy? What a good question. Um, I would just immediately go back to Robert Louis Stevenson. Um, for me, like he's like a lodestone, um, because that was the book that I discovered that I could like books. So everything he's ever written, I've always felt it was kind of holy. Uh, so like Kidnapped or Treasure Island or Catriona or any of his books. Even he, he's got some great travel books like Traveling with a Donkey, and so for me that that's always a, a really really big one for me. And um, and I also like funny books when I'm really stuck on something. So I'll like I'll read a lot of P.G. Woodhouse um, because he's just he's never not funny. I mean he wrote about what thirty of those uh, yeah Jeeves books, and they're all just always funny. Uh, you never go more than two three two or three pages without a really really good joke. So I, that's what I like to go to is the funny and the good. It is surprising <laughs> and gratifying that you make those two. So when people ask, you know, who's your favorite author? I say, well, I, I have been reading since I was three years old. You can read a lot of stuff in 64 years. And so I like lots and lots of different things. But I have five what I might call role models as when it comes to writing. And one of those is Robert Louis Stevenson, mm -hmm. from whom I learned the art of narrative, you know, and how you keep a story going based on its characters and all that. B.G. Woodhouse, from whom I learned how much fun you can have with the English language <laughs> without, you know, actually shooting anyone. And uh, let's see, then there's Dorothy Lee Sayers. Uh, She's great. And yeah, from whom I learned, you know, how to do social nuance through dialogue and how important dialogue is to depicting a character. It's the single best tool you have for uh, for showing. To read God, so, yeah. Yeah. What a fantastic no, yeah, man is that. Yeah. So and that's a, you know, she writes murder mysteries for the most part. Body Night is her biggest, most ambitious novel, and there are no one so skills. <laughs> that's it, but it's terrific. Yeah, so there's those three. Oh, and Charles Dickens, from whom I learned how to describe characters succinctly and vividly. Mm -hmm. uh, not that I'm at all succinct, but I am vivid. And uh, let's see, who's the fifth one? Oh, John D. MacDonald. Oh, oh, right. Yeah, yeah. It's so a very well a thriller writer. Crime fiction yeah. in there. Oh, yeah. I love crime fiction. That's probably a lot of the story are. But yeah, <laughs> <laughs> there's a reason why yeah. I have it this bookstore. Um, I've been here for 30 odd years. Uh, some odder than others. But uh, yeah. <laughs> for me, my John Neil McDonald would be Dashiell Hammett, I think. Um, Dashiell. Wow. He only wrote five books in his entire life, and every one is a masterpiece. And everyone is in a slightly different genre, which is just incredible. And um, I don't know, I mean, he, he finished his last book and then lived another 30 years. I never wrote another thing, really, at all. Uh, it's a complete mystery, and it's almost as, to me, it's as tragic as Mozart's young death. The fact that we could have had like another 15 of Dashiell Hammett's novels. Yes, ma'am. Dashiell Hammett. Uh, he wrote The Thin Man and a few others. Maltese, Maltese Falcon. Falcon. Maltese Falcon, Falcon. Oh, okay. yeah. That's what you would do. Red Harvest. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Um, so, could you talk a bit about. Um, so, I too did Return of the Native O levels. I, I, I was an Amphibur in mm -hmm. the 80s. Or about Sinatra? Amphibur. Time. So, so you knew the Slater word as well? Yes. 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 <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but, like, you would never have thought of something like. Um, a book somebody like yourself or Anna Burns or Wendy Erskine or whatever, right? Because we were reading Thomas Hardy mm -hmm. and the cho your choice of poets textbook, you know. Um, so I was just wondering, you know, if, if you have any thoughts you can share with everybody about kind of what's happening now with, um, you know, things like the Ferryman Get Rich Only mm -hmm. and, you know, your book and Wendy's and um, Anna Burns and all of that. I mean, it just seems like we're sort of at um, I, love, I love where we are, but I'm just curious if you... Uh, did did everyone hear the question? No. Um, uh, the question is, um, there's 
a strange thing has happened in Belfast in the last two or three years, at least with Belfast writers. Um, this play that is on Broadway at the moment called The Ferryman has just won the Tony Award for Best Play. The Booker Prize this year went to Anna Burns' novel Milkman, which is set in Belfast. And there's all, all these other awards, and there's more focus on writers from Belfast. And in the 70s and 80s and 90s, there were no writers at all from Belfast. There were poets. There were there was Seamus Heaney, there was Paul Muldoon, there was um, Dacre, there was you know there were all these great poets, but no one was writing novels about um, Northern Ireland and it just was not happening. But in the last three or four years there's just been this extraordinary renaissance that's happened. And I think I I've, I've got my own theory and my theory is that the Good Friday Agreement happened in nineteen ninety eight and it just took a while, it took about ten years for things to settle down and for all, for everybody to start processing all this madness that happened in our childhoods. Yeah. I mean, we grew up in this, just basically a civil war in the 1970s and 1980s. This basically soldiers in the streets, bombs everywhere, people being killed, um, our schools <laughs> being blown up. And it's a, bit, a lot of it was like Syria. Um, and just all this madness happened. And then after 10 years, it was the peace dividend, and gradually it's starting to um, start. People start to realize that, that all these people that have been silenced for a, a generation, that they have an amazing, especially the, the the women that were silenced. There were all these women um, who were sometimes taken off and actually murdered. Um, uh, yeah, Jean McConville. And the, um, the, there's the fantastic book on that called Say Nothing, um, which won the George Orwell Prize. Um, which is about, the, about the silencing of Belfast women, um, but the, I'll give you a really good example. When the, when Milkman come, Milkman was it's won the Booker Prize this year. It came out um, last. I got the book last May, and it was given to me by the editor of the Irish Times, and he sent it to me in galley, and he said, Adrian, could you do a review of this book for the Irish Times? And he said because it's the only review this book's ever going to get. And um, because no one else is going to read this book, it's going to just vanish into the void. And her previous book, Anna Burns's previous book, was sitting at like number two and a half million on um, Amazon, and it had one three star review. And so I read Milkman, and um, and I thought, well, he's absolutely right. It's the only review this is ever going to get. By God, I'm going to get a bloody great review um, because I love the book. So I reviewed Milkman for the Irish Times, and I said everybody should read this book um, because it's funny, it's poetic, it's beautiful, and um, and I just crusaded for Milkman. And um, about two weeks after my review came out in the Irish Times, the Guardian did a review, and the Guardian review was ecstatic. They also loved the book, and then after the Guardian had reviewed it, and the Irish Times had reviewed it. The Irish Independent felt they had to review it, and then um, the Times reviewed it, and then the Telegraph reviewed it, and then all these other people started realizing, oh my god, this book's really, really good. And um, and I'll tell you, uh, um, and so then I knew that we were in with the chance with Anna Burns, because Val McDermott was on the Booker Prize long list, and Val reads everything, and she's not a snob. And she reads the high, she reads the low, she, is, she reads 150 books a year. And I knew if Val could get to see this book, she would appreciate that it was brilliant. And so, um, it, much, I mean, and then my man, one of my best friends, this guy called Owen McNamee, he's also a crime writer from Northern he went to interview her in um, London, he did this interview with her, I think for The Guardian or for The Irish Times, and I hadn't met her, and I said to well, what's she like? Uh, once and he says, he said, to be honest, Adrian, it looks like she could do with a good meal. Uh, and, oh, and, 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 the, and the funny thing about it was, she was getting her food from food banks. Yeah. Oh, she was yeah. literally starving. Yeah. And, um, and I thought, well, wouldn't this be just a miracle if this book could win the Booker Prize? And, um, and then, sure enough, um, it, it won the Booker Prize. She sold half a million copies. It won a hundred thousand pounds um, for the Booker Prize and the George Orwell Prize. And so it's a it's a fairy story, and and it's a and it's a real triumph, not just for Anna, but for also this whole generation yeah. who has been silenced over the last twenty years. Yes, sir. What's the chances of your book being a movie? Uh, well, you know, that's uh, if you'd asked me that two weeks ago, I would have said zero. 
um, because I've never had one of my books um, being turned into a movie, but I got this phone call last Friday, um, which has kind of changed everything. Um, I, I, one of my books was optioned for the, the movies before, and I got quite heavily involved in it. And I flew out to LA a number of times, and um, and then I got really disappointed when nothing happened, you know. But, but that's that's the nature of the beast. For every hundred books that get optioned, maybe ten get turned into screenplays. Maybe one gets made into a film. So I'd said to my agent, I don't want to know anything about any movie talk until we come to there's a contract to be signed. And he said, Are you sure? And I said, Yeah, I just. I, this stuff is all fairy gold. Hollywood's always fairy gold. And so last Friday, um, I was at home and it said, Adrian, uh, remember you said that you didn't want to know anything about this until a contract has to be signed? He says, well, you better get your wife in here because uh, we have to sign a contract. And I said, well, what's happening? He says, well, Paramount wants to make, your, make the chain into a movie. And I go, are you serious? And he goes, yes. And he says, and they want their we want the decision by today. Wow. And, and, I was, and then I said, well, it's a lot of money. And he says, well, to you, it's an awful lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> so I think you should take it. And so we did. And it's, uh, it's been optioned by Paramount. Oh. Yeah. Yes, sir. Do you foresee having an Australia novel since you bought there? Oh my God! You know, you know, I was just thinking about this the other day. I lived in Diana lives in Arizona and writes about Scotland. I think that's so. I think that's crucial. <laughs> I could never write about Ireland when I lived in Ireland. I couldn't write one word. Um, and uh, but as soon as I left, I started having dreams about Ireland. I started hearing music of Ireland. I started thinking about foods of Ireland. I, the whole thing. Um, this book is set in Massachusetts. I lived in Massachusetts for a long time. I could never write anything about Massachusetts when I was there. As soon as I got out of Massachusetts, I started thinking about uh, Jonathan Rickman, the Roadrunner song. I started thinking about um, the Stop and Shops. I started thinking about everything about Boston. Uh, I could, I could found that I could write about Boston. I lived in Australia for the last nine years. I couldn't write one word about Australia. But for the last six months, I've been having these weird Australian dreams and ideas. And uh, so, yeah, I don't know what it is, but maybe exile or not being close or something. But I think being away from a place really does help you get some perspective on it. Yeah. You think distance? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, possibly. Had you been to Scotland before you wrote? Uh, no, I had not. I wrote Outlander from library research. This was before the internet existed, and so uh, I did it in the library. I just went to the library and typed Thailand's Scotland, 18th century. And luckily, the card catalog had just been electronified, so I could do a search and didn't have to go through the cards. But uh, I came up with 38 references, so I went to those shelves. And there were 400 books on Scotland, you know, costume, geography, history, language, everything. So I just tipped it along and took out anything that looked interesting, and that's where I started. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah, you got the midges right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's horrible. It's horrible, horrible. Yeah. Every time you go to Scotland, you think, oh my god, it looks so beautiful. And then when you're actually walking in the hills, you <laughs> well, I've heard people talk about the midges. In fact, my younger daughter married a Scotsman. They got married on the Isle of Bute, which uh, oh, had a lovely evening wedding and so forth. But midges everywhere, <laughs> and so everyone at the in the wedding party were taking photos of the back lawn. <laughs> and that's where I discovered that while I am eaten alive by mosquitoes here, every mosquito in town sleeps on me. Midges do not like me. I can walk right through really? a pile of them and none of them will bite me. You've got some sort of magical power over the midges. No, they love me and midges. Yeah, but maybe mosquitoes won't bite you, you know. So, could I end this by saying that Diana actually went to Scotland and got a wonderful award um, called the Thistle Award. It's called the Thistle Award, yeah for services to Scottish tourism. <laughs> Evidently, according to them, I have single-handedly raised the Scottish economy by 72%. <laughs> <laughs> yeah,
TV show and a few other things. You know. So there's a goal for you, right yes. there. That you do that for Melbourne? I will, I will, I will uh, increase tourism, but uh, no one's going to that part of Massachusetts after reading that book. <laughs> We're going to avoid ever going to New England ever again. After reading it. But maybe I'll, I'll do my bit for that class tourism with an actual. All right, so let's give our authors a round of applause. Now you can see why I want you to read the piece from the Wall Street Journal that was folded into your book, right? Because yeah. there's, there's a lot of backstory here that can't you guess. So here's what we're going to ask you to do. We're going to ask you to stand up and fold up your chairs and lean them against the wall. I'm going to say goodbye to